The Scene Society by Eric Fromm. Chapter 2. Can a society be sick? The pathology of normalcy. To speak of a whole society as lacking in mental health implies a controversial assumption contrary to the position of sociological relativism held by most social scientists today. They postulate that each society is normal in as much as it as it functions, and that pathology can be defined only in terms of the individual's lack of adjustment to the ways of life in his society. To speak of a sane society implies a premise different from sociological relativism. It makes sense only if we assume that there can be a society which is not sane, and this assumption, in turn, implies that there are universal criteria for mental health which are valid for the human race as such, and according to which the state of health of each society can be judged. This position of normative humanism is based on a few fundamental premises. The species man can be defined not only in anatomical and physiological terms, its members share basic psychic qualities, the laws which govern their mental and emotional functioning, and the aims for a satisfactory solution of the problem of human existence. It is true that our knowledge of man is still so incomplete that we cannot yet give a satisfactory definition of man in a psychological sense. It is the task of the science of man to arrive eventually at a correct description of what deserves to be called human nature. What has often been called human nature is but one of its many manifestations, and often a pathological one, and the function of such mistaken definition usually has been to defend a particular type of society as being the necessary outcome of man's mental constitution. Against such reactionary use of the concept of human nature, the liberals since the 18th century have stressed the malleability of human nature and the decisive influence of environmental factors. True and important as such emphasis is, it has led many social scientists to an assumption that man's mental constitution is a blank piece of paper on which society and culture write their text, and which has no intrinsic quality of its own. This assumption is just as untenable and just as destructive of social progress as the opposite view was. The real problem is to infer the core common to the whole human race from the innumerable manifestations of human nature, the normal as well as the pathological ones, as we can observe them in different individuals and cultures. The task is furthermore to recognize the laws inherent in human nature and the inherent goals for its development and unfolding. This concept of human nature is different from the way the term human nature is used conventionally. Just as man transforms the world around him, so he transforms himself in the process of history. He is his own creation, as it were. But just as he can only transform and modify the natural materials around him according to their nature, so he can only transform and modify himself according to his own nature. What man does in the process of history is to develop this potential and to transform it according to its own possibilities. The point of view taken here is neither a biological nor a sociological one if that if that would mean separating these two aspects from each other. It is rather one transcending such dichotomy by the assumption that the, that the main passions and drives in man result from the total existence of man, that they are definite and ascertainable, some of them conducive to health and happiness, others to sickness and unhappiness. Any given, any given social order does not create these fundamental strivings, but it determines which of the limited number of potential passions are to become manifest or dominant. Man, as he appears in any given culture, is always a manifestation of human nature, a manifestation, however, which in its specific outcome is determined by the social arrangements under which he lives. Just as the infant is born with all human potentialities which are to develop under favorable social and cultural conditions, so the human race in the process of history develops into what, is, what it potentially is. 
The approach of normative humanism is based on the assumption that, as in any other problem, there are right and wrong, satisfactory and unsatisfactory solutions to the problem of human existence. Mental health is achieved if man develops into full maturity according to the characteristics and laws of human nature. Mental illness consists in the failure of such, de of such development. From this premise, the criterion of mental health is not one of individual adjustment to a given social order, but a universal one, valid for all men, of giving a satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. What is so deceptive about the state of mind of the members of a society is the consensual validation of their concepts. It is naively assumed that the fact that the majority of people share certain ideas or feelings proves the validity of these ideas and feelings. Nothing is, further, nothing is further from the truth. Consensual validation, as such, has no bearing whatsoever on reason or mental health. Just as there is a folie à deux, there is a folie à million. The fact that millions of people share the same vices does not make these vices virtues. The fact that they share so many errors does not make the errors to be truths. And the fact that millions of people share the same forms of mental pathology does not make these people sane. There is, however, an important difference between individual and social mental illness, which suggests a differentiation between two concepts, that of defect and that of neurosis. If a person fails to attain freedom, spontaneity, a genuine expression of self, he may be considered to have a severe defect provided we assume that freedom and spontaneity are the objective goals to be attained by every human being. If such a goal is not attained by the majority of members of any given society, we deal with the phenomenon of socially patterned defect. The individual shares it with many others. He is not aware of it as a defect and his security is not threatened by the experience of being different, of being an outcast, as it were. What he may have lost in richness and in a genuine feeling of happiness is made up by the security of fitting in with the rest of mankind, as he knows them. As a matter of fact, his very defect may have been raised to a virtue by his culture, and thus may give him an enhanced feeling of achievement. An illustration is the feeling of guilt and anxiety which Calvin's doctrines aroused in men. It may be said that the person who is overwhelmed by a feeling of his own powerlessness and unworthiness, by unceasing doubt as to whether he is saved or condemned to eternal punishment, who is hardly capable of genuine joy, suffers from a severe defect. Yet this very defect was culturally patterned. It was looked upon as particularly valuable, and the individual was thus protected from the neurosis which he would have acquired in a culture where the same defect gave him a feeling of profound inadequacy and isolation. Spinoza formulated the problem of the socially patterned defect very clearly. He says, Many people are seized by one and the same affect with great consistency. All his senses are so strongly affected by one object that he believes this object to be present even if it is not. If this happens while the person is awake, the person is believed to be insane. But if the greedy person thinks only of money and possessions, the ambitious one only of fame, one does not think of them as being insane, but only as annoying. Generally, one has contempt for them. But factually, greediness, ambition, and so forth are forms of insanity, although usually one does not think of them as illness. These words were written a few hundred years ago. They still hold true, although the defects have been culturally patterned to such an extent now that they are not even generally thought anymore to be annoying or contemptible. Today we come across a person who acts and feels like an automaton, who never experiences anything which is really his, who experiences himself entirely as the person he thinks he is supposed to be whose artificial smile has replaced genuine laughter, whose meaningless chatter has replaced communicative speech, whose dulled despair has taken the place of genuine pain. Two statements can be made about this person. One is that he suffers from a defective spontaneity, 
and individuality, which may seem incurable. At the same time, it may be said that he does not differ essentially from millions of others who are in the same position. For most of them, the cultural the culture provides patterns which enable them to live with a defect without becoming ill. It is as if it is as if each culture provided the remedy against the outbreak of manifest neurotic symptoms which would result from the defect produced by it. Suppose that in our Western culture, movies, radios, television, sports events, and newspapers cease to function for only four weeks. With these main avenues of escape closed, what would be the consequence for people thrown back upon their own resources? I have no doubt that even in this short time, thousands of nervous breakdowns would occur, and many more thousands of people would be thrown into a state of acute anxiety, not different from the picture which is diagnosed clinically as neurosis. If the opiate against the socially patterned defect were withdrawn, the manifest illness would make its appearance. For a minority, the pattern provided by the culture does not work. They are often those whose individual defect is more severe than that of the average person, so that the culturally offered remedies are not sufficient to prevent the outbreak of manifest illness. A case in point is the person whose aim in life is to attain power and fame. While this aim is, in itself, a pathological one, there is nevertheless a difference between the person who uses his powers to attain this aim realistically and the more severely sick one who has so little emerged from his infantile grandiosity that he does not do anything toward the attainment of his goal, but waits for a miracle to happen, and, thus feeling more and more powerless, ends up in a feeling of futility and bitterness. But there are also those whose character structure, and hence whose conflicts, differ from those of the majority, so that the remedies which are effective for most of their fellow men are of no help to, to them. Among this group, we sometimes find people of greater integrity and sensitivity than the majority, who for this very reason are incapable of accepting the cultural opiate, while at the same time they are not strong and healthy enough to live soundly against the stream. The foregoing discussion on the difference between neurosis and the socially patterned defect may give the impression that if society only provides the remedies against the outbreak of manifest symptoms, all goes well and it can continue to function smoothly, however great the defects created by it. History shows us, however, that this is not the case. It is true indeed that man, in contrast to the animal, shows an almost infinite malleability, just as he can eat almost anything, live under practically any kind of climate, and adjust himself to it. There is hardly any psychic condition which he cannot endure, and under which he cannot carry on. He can live free and as a slave, rich and in luxury and under conditions of half-starvation. He can live as a warrior and peaceably, as an exploiter and robber, and as a member of a cooperating and loving fellowship. There is hardly a psychic state in which man cannot live, and hardly anything which cannot be done with him, and for which he cannot be used. All these considerations seem to justify the assumption that there is no such thing as a nature common to all men, and that would mean, in fact, that there is no such thing as a species, man, except in a physiological and anatomical sense. Yet, in spite of all this evidence, the history of man shows that we have omitted one fact. Despots and ruling cliques can succeed in dominating and exploiting their fellow man. But they cannot prevent reactions to this inhuman treatment. Their subjects become frightened, suspicious, lonely, and if not due to external reasons, their systems collapse at some point because fears, suspicions, and loneliness eventually incapacitate the majority to function effectively and intelligently. Whole nations or social groups within them can be subjugated and exploited for a long time, but they react. They react with apathy or such impairment of intelligence, initiative, and skills that they gradually fail to perform the functions which, which should serve their rulers. 
or they react by the accumulation of such hate and destructiveness as to bring about an end to themselves, their rulers, and their system. Again, the reaction may create such independence and longing for freedom that a better society is built upon their creative impulses. Which reaction occurs depends on many factors, on economic and political ones, and on the spiritual climate in which people live. But whatever the reactions are, the statement that man can live under almost any condition is only half true. It must be supplemented by the other statement, that if he lives under conditions which are contrary to his nature and to the basic requirements for human growth and sanity, he cannot help reacting. He must either deteriorate and perish or bring about conditions which are more in accordance with his needs. That human nature and society can have conflicting demands and hence that a whole society can be sick is an assumption which was made very explicitly by Freud, most extensively in his civilization and its discontents. He starts out with the premise of a human nature common to the human race throughout all cultures and ages and of certain ascertainable needs and strivings inherent in that nature. He believes that culture and civilization develop in an ever-increasing contrast to the needs of man, and thus he arrives at the concept of the social neurosis. If the evolution of civilization, he writes, has such a far-reaching similarity with the development of an individual, and if the same methods are employed in both, would not the diagnosis be justified that many systems of civilization, or epochs of it, possibly even the whole of humanity, have become neurotic under the pressure, pressure of the civilizing trends? To analytic dissection of these neuroses, therapeutic recommendations might follow, which could claim a great practical interest. I would not say that such an attempt to apply psychoanalysis to civilized society would be fanciful or doomed to fruitlessness, but it behooves us to be very careful not to forget that after all we are dealing only with analogies and that it is dangerous, not only with men, but also with concepts to drag them out of the region where they originated and have matured. The diagnosis of collective neuroses, moreover, will be confronted by a special difficulty. In the neurosis of an individual, we can use as a starting point the contrast presented to us between the patient and his environment, which we assume to be normal. No such background as this would be available for any society similarly affected. It would have to be supplied in some other way. And with regard to any therapeutic application of our knowledge, what would be the use of the most acute analysis of social neuroses, neuroses since no one possesses the power to compel the community to adopt the therapy? In spite of all these difficulties, we may expect that one day someone will venture upon this research into into the pathology of civilized communities. This book does venture upon this research. It is based on the idea that a sane society is that which corresponds to the needs of man, not necessarily to what he feels to be his needs, because even the most pathological aims can be felt subjectively as that which the person wants most, but to what his needs are objectively, as they can be ascertained by the study of man. It is our first task, then, to ascertain what is the nature of man and what are the needs which stem from this nature. We then must proceed to examine the role of society in the evolution of man and to study its furthering role for the development of men as well as the recurrent conflicts between human nature and society and the consequences of these conflicts, particularly as far as modern society is concerned.